Father God, we thank you for the Bible study on tonight. God, we give you all the glory, honor, and the praise because you deserve it. God, we honor you and we lift you up. God, we thank you for what you're going to show us and reveal unto us on tonight. Lord, let us study your word to show ourselves approved. Workmen who need not to be ashamed. God, let your word dwell richly in us. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. So God, speak on tonight, Lord, through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's begin in Hosea chapter 10. Beginning at verse number one, Hosea 10, verse one. It says, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. So as we've been talking about throughout this series, that in the book of Hosea, at the beginning, God commands Hosea or instructs Hosea to go and marry a prostitute. And Hosea chooses the prostitute Gomer as his wife. And God uses this marriage or, or this relationship to represent Israel's relationship with God, with the Lord. Israel, as God described in this book of Hosea, had become a spiritual whore. They had turned against God. As we saw last week, it said in, in chapter 9 that God chose Israel as great in the wilderness. We know they were, they were in Egypt. He brought them out of Egypt, took them through the wilderness. He selected them to be his chosen people, his special people to reveal him to the rest of the world. But along the way, Israel, they became idolatrous, as God described it. They became spiritually, spiritual harlots or spiritual whores. They began worshiping false idols. They began getting caught up into idolatry and materialism. They forgot about God even though he selected them to be his wife or his bride, his chosen people, he considered himself married to Israel, but they went after other lovers. They went after riches. They went after idols. They went after all types of sin. So he's telling them in chapter 10, verse number one, you are an empty vine. You bring it forth fruit unto yourself. According to the multitude of your fruit, you have increased altars, meaning they have created more false idols, false gods. And he says, according to the goodness of the land, they have made goodly images. So they took all the prosperity and the wealth that God blessed them with in the promised land. They use all this material wealth and prosperity to make and create false idols. Instead of them giving on the God and serving God and worshiping God, they use their substance and offer it up un unto these false idols. They began serving these false idols. And God's complaint against them was that they were not producing fruit towards him. They were not producing the fruit of righteousness. He says they were an empty vine. He didn't say they were a dead vine. He said they were an empty vine, meaning that they were still a vine. They still had the potential for life, but they were not producing life unto God. If you think about a natural vine, you might see a vine in your yard or in a forest or on the side of the road. That vine, it might be green, but it's not bearing any fruit. It's not producing any fruit. And that's how Israel was. They were not producing any fruit. They were a vine, they just were an empty vine. They were not a living vine that had strong roots that would produce fruit. They did not have the seed of righteousness on the inside of them. That was their problem. They were producing fruit under false gods, false idols. They were committing sin and all types of lewdness, all types of evil. 
So their service was to these false idols, these false gods, and also to their flesh. They were not serving God out of a pure heart. They did not have righteousness on the inside of them. That's why God says they, were, they are an empty vine, meaning they were not producing fruit unto him. So they had become divided between God and false idols. Their heart was divided between God and these false images or idols. God did not have their whole entire heart. They thought that they can just give part of themselves unto God and still serve these false idols. But God is telling them that's not what he wanted. He wanted their whole devotion, their entire heart. He wanted all of them. He didn't just want part of them. He wanted all of them. So God promises in verse number two that he will break down their altars and spoil their images, meaning that he would destroy those false idols, those false images they had constructed and made their gods. He was going to punish them by destroying those false idols. Let's go to verse number three. For now they shall say, we have no king because we fear not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? They have spoken words swearing falsely in making a covenant. Thus judgment springeth up as hemlock in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria shall fear because of the calves of Beth Avon. For the people thereof shall mourn over it. And the priests thereof that rejoiced on it for the glory thereof, because it is departed from it. It shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Samaria, her king is cut off as the foam upon the water. The high places also of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. In these particular verses, God was telling the people, because they would not fear the wrath of God or severity of his punishment, until they saw their idols being destroyed. They said, we have no king because we fear not the Lord. What then should a king do to us? So God was promising to destroy their entire system. Their nation would be destroyed. As we said earlier, Assyria, the nation of Assyria, would come and take them hostage or take them captive. So they would not realize that they were in trouble until they saw all these things happening, until they saw their idols and statues being destroyed and torn down. Then they would recognize the fear of God. They would have the fear of God and recognize his wrath. They would become ashamed for having trusted in these false idols. And we know today that people create idols not just out of statues, but they also create idols out of things in life. People can make their job their idol. They can make their car, their house their idol. They can make money their idol. They can make another human being their idol. So Israel had made idols out of statues and false gods. But God was telling them that these idols could do nothing for them. These idols they were serving would not be able to help them when God's wrath was put in place. When his wrath was released, there was nothing these false idols could do for them. Same goes for us. These things that we put so much trust and stock into, they cannot do anything for us when we get in trouble. If you get a terminal illness, all the money in the world will not save you. Only God's power can help you and save you. Your spouse, your significant other cannot save you from God's wrath. Your job cannot save you from God's wrath. Your job cannot save you if there's a, a natural disaster that takes place in the earth. What can your job do? 
Can your job rescue you from a hurricane or an earthquake? Can the people that you put so much emphasis on and so much interest into, can they save you from natural disasters? Can they save you from terminal illness? Can they save you from death? So we are not to idolize anything on this earth. We ought to give the one true God all of our devotion, all of our heart. The Bible says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we ought to love him first and foremost. But Israel forgot about that. They had the commandments of God. They had the word of God, but they forgot about what God told them about not making graven images or false idols and statues. They substituted their trust in God for trust in false idols. And God is telling them that once his wrath is released, there's nothing those false gods and idols can do for them. Not a thing. Let's go on to verse number nine. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah, there they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. It is in my desire that I should chastise them, and the people shall be gathered against them, when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. And Ephraim is as an heifer that is taught, and loveth to tread out the corn. But I passed over her, passed upon, over upon her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to ride. Judah shall plow, and Jacob shall break his clods. So God is telling them that in verse number nine, they have sinned from the days of Gibeah. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to turn to Judges chapter 20, but that's what he's referring to, Judges chapter 20. You can go back and read that later. He, talk, he talks about what happened at Gibeah, what sin they committed at Gibeah how they murdered the, the wife or the concubine of a Levite. The Levites were God's chosen priests, God's chosen servants amongst the tribes of Israel. And the other Israelites went and killed and, or murdered the concubine of one of the Levites. So God was comparing what happened back then to what they were doing in the present in, in chapter 10 of Hosea. And he says that verse number 10, he, it is his desire that he should chastise them and the people shall be gathered, get, gathered against them when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. Ephraim is as a heifer that is taught and loveth to tread out the corn. So he compares the Northern kingdom of Israel, Ephraim, which is the northern kingdom. Israel was divided into two kingdoms, Ephraim and Judah. Ephraim was the northern kingdom. Judah was the southern kingdom. So he said he's pronouncing judgment upon both kingdoms, the north and the south. He says Ephraim is as a heifer that is taught and loves to tread out the corn. What he was, what he was referring to is that Ephraim felt like it was privileged. It was a heifer that was taught and loved to tread out the corn, meaning that they had an easy path. If you think about a mule, back in the old days, they would use mules to plow before tractors were invented. They would have to use a mule to plow. And they would use mules and animals to do their farming and their farm work, field work. So God compares Ephraim, the northern kingdom, to a heifer that was taught or trained, one that was trained to tread out the corn. But he says, I passed over upon her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to ride. So if you think about a mule that plows in the field, that mule has a harder job than a mule that does not plow. The mule that would tread out the corn, they would have a device with a mule attached to it. 
and that mule will go around in a circle and grind the corn or tread out the corn. So that mule had an easier job than a mule that was in the field plowing. So the mules that were put into the field to plow, they had to wear a yoke around their necks. And that yoke would attach multiple mules together. And then you would have the farmer that was directing those mules to plow. So God is saying that Ephraim would be like a mule or an heifer that once was treading out the corn, but now they would have to plow. They would be judged. That's what he was saying. They would have, they would experience more difficult times because they had, they had to face God's punishment. He says that Judah shall plow and Jacob shall break his claws, meaning that both the Northern kingdom and the Southern kingdom will experience the same judgment. They both will experience God's wrath because of their activities, because of their actions. So they might've had it good at one time. They might've experienced all this material prosperity all this joy and happiness. They might have been serving all these false gods and false idols, but God is saying that judgment is coming. You do not want to change. You do not want to repent, but judgment is coming. Verse number 12, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, Ye have reaped iniquity. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. Therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled, as Shalman spoiled Beth Arbor in the day of battle. The mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. So shall Bethel do unto you because of your great wickedness. In a morning shall the king of Israel utterly be cut off. So God was telling the people to repent. Going back to verse number 12, he says, so, in your, so to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. He was telling them, seek my face, turn from your wickedness, turn from your wicked ways and seek my face. Turn from all this evil that you are doing. Turn from the idolatry. Turn from all the sin that you are committing. Seek my face. If you seek my face, you will receive mercy. But they didn't want to do it. They cannot understand that. But God tells them, if you do not repent, if you do not turn to me for mercy, if you do not seek after righteousness, you're going to be punished. In verse 14, he says, a tumult shall arise among thy people. All thy fortresses shall be spoiled. Because of their great wickedness. So God is urging them to repent. He's urging them to turn from their wicked ways and seek him. So what does love have to do with what God is saying here, God still loved the people, but the people did not have the same love in return unto God. They were his chosen people. He was giving them opportunity after opportunity to repent and seek his face, to turn from sin and turn to righteousness, but they refused to do it. They were so caught up in idolatry, so caught up in the ways of the world, so caught up into the flesh, pleasing the flesh, satisfying the flesh. They could not see that God wanted them to live righteous lives and seek him. Let's go to chapter 11. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed unto Balaam and burn incense to graven images. 
So God is saying when Israel was a child, he means that when Israel was a young nation, before, before they had become a developed nation, he saw them as a child. And he says, I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. So he brought them out of Egypt. He brought them out of the bondage of the Egyptians. And he took them to the promised land. That's what he's saying. But in spite of the goodness that God displayed unto them, what happened? They still fell back into idolatry. He says in verse number two that they sacrificed unto Balaam. Balaam meaning multiple types of, of false idols and false gods. And they burn incense to graven images. Verse three, I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man, with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke on their jaws. And I laid meat unto them. He was talking about bringing them out of Egypt through the wilderness. He provided for them. He healed them. Now, if you go back in history, God promised the people when he brought them out of Egypt, he said, I am the Lord God that healeth thee. I will put none of the evil diseases of the Egyptians upon thee. Now, the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 and some years, 430 years to be exact. While they were in Egypt, they picked up the customs of Egypt. All the habits of the Egyptians, they adopted those habits and those customs, those practices. In Egypt, they use medicine. They use medicine to heal, to heal themselves in Egypt. That's what the Egyptians did. But when God brought his people out of Egypt, they did not need to use drugs or medicine for healing because he made them a promise. He says, I am the Lord God that healeth thee. I will put none of the evil diseases of the Egyptians upon thee. So God was their healer. He was their medicine. In the book of Proverbs, it says he sent his word. His word is health unto our flesh. In Psalms 107, it says that he sent his word and healed his people. So God was their healer when he brought them out of Egypt. They did not need the drugs that they used to use in Egypt or the medicine they used to use in Egypt. God was their healer. God kept them healthy and well. But he says here in verse number three, they knew not that I healed them. So God had blessed them, prospered them. But they didn't even recognize that God was the one that actually healed them. They had strayed so, so far away from God that they could not see that he was their healer. That he was the one providing for them. And when they come into the promised land, they begin to offer sacrifices on the false gods and false idols. They thought their false gods and false idols were the ones that were making them prosperous and wealthy. So they attributed their success to these false gods and false idols. But God is trying to get them to realize that he was the one that took care of them in the wilderness. He's the one that brought them out of Egypt. He's the one that provided for them. He kept them healthy. He kept them well. Because they were his chosen people. But instead, they looked to the world. They adopted the ways of the world. Instead of advising or suggesting to the world to adopt the ways of God. They had the ways of God in the written word. The law that God gave Moses. But instead of them invoking the, the world to come to God, they went the other direction. They fell into the traps, the traps of the world, the customs of the world, the ways of the world. They forgot about God. 
So they became worldly. And we see that happening in the body of Christ today. They are adopting the customs of the world, the ways of the world. They are turning to the ways of the world instead of trying to get the world to turn to God. Let's go to verse number five. Verse five, Hosea chapter 11. He shall not return into the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king because they refuse to return. And the sword shall abide on his cities and shall consume his branches and devour them because of their own counsels. And my people are bent to backsliding from me. Though they called them to the most high, none at all would exalt him. So God announces his wrath upon them because of their backsliding. He tells them that this time, instead of being within the captivity of Egypt, this time it would be Assyria, the nation of Assyria. Assyria would be God's instrument of judgment upon Israel. He says his people in verse number seven are bent to backsliding, meaning that they were inclined to backsliding. That was their nature to backslide. They had gotten so far from God that they were naturally inclined to backslide. That's what happens when you get far away from God and from the things of God. You become inclined to sin. That becomes your natural inclination to sin. It becomes a habit. It becomes natural practice to sin. Once you start participating in sin, it becomes easier and easier to do it. And Israel had become so accustomed to sinning that that became their nature. Backsliding became their nature. Verse number eight. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as the bowen? My heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee. And I will not enter into the city. So here in these verses, God is looking inwardly to himself not at the people but he's looking in inwardly at his at his own at, at himself at his own heart he's examining his own heart and he's telling himself how shall i deliver thee israel he's asking asking himself these questions how shall I make thee as Adma? How shall I set thee as the Boam? What was Adma and what was the Boam? If you go back to the book of Genesis, there were two cities named Sodom and Gomorrah. And in these cities, they had become extremely corrupt and extremely wicked. They were engaged in all types of wickedness and sin such as homosexuality lust and perversion and we know the story how god destroyed sodom and gomorrah he destroyed those two cities because of the things that were going on in those cities not only did he destroy sodom and gomorrah he also destroyed adma and zeboam those were neighboring cities to sodom and gomorrah so God's judgment fell on those cities also. So God is saying, how can I destroy Israel? I love Israel. How can I do unto them what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam? He's saying that they deserve to be punished just like those cities. But because God is gracious and merciful, he decides to spare Israel. He decides to give them another chance. 
So when you are in covenant with God, when you confess the Lord as your savior, you might have some people that turn away from God. They go back, they backslide into sin. They stray away from God for a season. God still loves those people. And he's merciful unto those people. He gives those people a chance to repent. And that's what he does here for Israel. He's giving them a chance to repent because of his loving nature and because of his character, he decides to withdraw a large scale destruction from falling upon Israel like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. He does not exact that type of punishment upon Israel because he loves them. So he says, my heart is turned within me. My repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. So he's saying he is not like man. He's different. If he had been like man, he would have punished them immediately. He would have repaid them the evil for the evil that they committed. But since he is just and fair and righteous, he does not do that. He decides to be merciful unto them and give them a chance to repent. Verse number 10, Hosea chapter 11. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. They shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt and as a dove out of the land of Assyria. And I will place them in their houses, saith the Lord. So God is telling them that they will walk after him. He's prophesying about the future. So he's talking about the future here. He's saying that in the future, eventually they will come to know him and they will obey him. They will follow after him. He says, they shall roar like a lion when he shall roar. Then the children shall tremble from the west. So once Israel in the future comes and returns back to God, then they will send forth a roar throughout the earth. And then he says, the children shall tremble from the West. Where is the West? Now, obviously, Israel is in the, the Middle East. So when he talks about the West, he's talking about the Western world, North America, South America, the part of the world that we live in. He's saying that when the rest of the world sees Israel returning back to God, and this is also prophesied in other books, of the prophets in the Old Testament, how Israel, there'll be a remnant that comes back to God in the future. Then the rest of the world would take notice because Israel rejected Jesus at his first coming. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, they rejected him. They did all the outward things, all the external religious things, but they, their heart was not for God. They did not have a heart of righteousness. But he's saying that in the future, things will change. Verse number 12, Ephraim compasseth me about with lies and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. So he's saying that in the midst of what was happening at that day and time, that there was still a remnant that was faithful unto him. Even in our day and age, in the midst of everything that's going on in the world, there's still a remnant of people that are faithful unto God. 
Now, there are some that are turning away from God. There are some that are straying away and going into apostasy, which is apostasy means straying away from the truth. They are turning from God. I saw it where in an article this week where it says that 30 to 60% of young believers, Christians, they think that there are multiple ways to salvation besides Jesus. Now, how can you be a Christian and you think that there are other ways of salvation? They were saying that these Christians believe that Muhammad and Buddha are equivalent to Jesus. You can also receive salvation through Muhammad and Buddha. So you have Christians that are straying away from the truth. But there's still a faithful remnant that serves God. That's what he's saying here. So we'll stop there for tonight. And we'll pick up next week with Hosea chapter 12. So tonight we covered 